Is it good to be dominant? Hey guys, Culture here. Today we're going to be discussing dominant personalities. More specifically, we'll look at aggressive versus assertive personalities and whether it's desirable to be dominant. This is by far the easiest question you've ever asked on the show. Of course being dominant is better. You get to exert your influence over others, make them do your bidding, and ultimately are revered and feared as the paragon of power. Some helpful insight there from our resident megalomaniac, Crash. I guess a more accurate way of phrasing my question is, is it good to act dominant? To act aggressively, to think of yourself as superior to others, and to actively invest effort into demonstrating that you're dominant. If that's good, then I'd rather be meek. After all, the meek shall inherit the earth. More like the meek shall inherit my girth. Of course it's good to act dominant. Just ask my two favorite YouTubers, KSI and Logan Paul. They understand what it means to be powerful. You have to grandstand, yell about how awesome you are, whilst at the same time tearing the other person's reputation to shreds. But doesn't it just seem like an ostentatious display of false superiority? To me, that just screams insecurity. They fling these disparaging remarks at one another and strut around with their chest puffed out, but ultimately, they both look the worse for it. Culture, let me mansplain this one to you. There are two types of people in this world, gorillas and baboons. Gorillas are alphas, dominance, and they let every other primate in the jungle know what's what. If you want to be a gorilla, you got to stand on that stage, beating your chest like a gorilla, jumping up and down saying, worship me, worship me. Then there are baboons. Baboons are beta cucks, total subs, and no one respects them. Sure, they'll laugh at them, maybe pal around, but when a gorilla and a baboon get in a fight, the gorilla always wins. You know why? Because when baboons get angry, their only move is to swell their butts into a red furnace of fury and bend over. Only baboons get butt hurt. Gorillas just get the job done. Thank you, Crash, for that truly terrifying look into the mind of a deranged lunatic. You're missing the point here. This chest beating, as you put it, is hollow. Empty boasting, arrogant pretentiousness, the epitome of braggadocio. These are the hallmarks of a true loser, in my opinion. What the hell is braggadocio? See, culture, it's because of words like that you got beat up in school. I didn't get beat up in school. What about that time Grant Jensen stuffed you in a dumpster? That was you, Crash. Oh. He made a fool out of you. Crash. Oh no! You smelled like garbage for a week, Crash. Oh no! The memories, they're all flooding back! Grant said, now you finally smell like what you are and the whole school laughed at you. Crash. I don't want to be a garbage boy, mommy! Why? Why? See, now Grant clearly asserted his dominance over you, but the way he went about it was horrible. Surely we can at least agree that physical violence and public humiliation aren't great ways to be dominant. I'm sorry, what did you say? I'm trying to repress memories again. <laughs> ah, that's... that's it. Much better. You were saying? Perhaps we should ground our discussion with some definitions of what personalities are likely to be dominant. The Big Five Personality Traits, also known as the Five Factor Model, is a psychological framework for describing an individual's personality. Essentially, this means you score yourself out of five categories representing different facets of your character. Certain personality types lend themselves to social dominance, and thus, by taking a simple questionnaire, experts can determine how likely you are to thrive in different situations. It's kind of like the Myers-Briggs personality test, that one where people are like, I'm an INTJ, or I'm an ESFP, or I'm a CLOD, you know the one. I scored a zero on that test. How is that even possible? The five traits are openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Ooh, I see we're getting spicy in this episode. Neuroticism, Crash, not eroticism. Though I'm sure if that was on the test, you would have scored 100. <gasps> That wasn't a compliment, by the way. We don't have time to do each of these personality traits in depth, but let's take a look at the three traits that are most likely to affect how dominant someone is. Extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Extroversion is the easiest category for us to understand. If someone is highly extroverted, they are more outgoing, assertive, and talkative. Low extroversion, however, corresponds to a more reserved, diffident, and quiet person. Huh. And here I thought extra virgin was a type of olive oil. Can you stop purposely misinterpreting me for comedic effect? We have a show to do here. Yes, boss. Now, based on those qualities, which would you suspect is a better indicator of social dominance? High extroversion or low extroversion? Who 
are you, Dora the Explorer? Just tell them already. Hi, extroversion, of course. If you're more outgoing, you tend to make more social connections, giving you more influence. This, of course, doesn't mean that introverts can't be dominant, but rather that it's less likely since they feel less need to engage with the external world. In the game of dominance, relationships with other people are paramount. It's no wonder KSI and Logan Paul have to show off all the time just to keep their reputation intact. See, you think you're so cool just because you don't care what other people think about you. But does that make you cool, culture? Does it really? As an introvert, you'd think guys like them are attention seekers whose self-worth depends on the opinions of others. But maybe extroverts would say that you're aloof, self-absorbed, or even standoffish. Maybe you're the weird one for not caring about other people's opinions. No, 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 no. Don't try to turn this around on me. I know plenty of extroverts that I think are awesome, that I'd love to hang out with. But these people I respect because their positive energies and desire to reach out to other people make me want to listen to their thoughts and opinions. They don't need to flaunt their fabricated facades just to get me to listen. They're assertive without being aggressive. In fact, that's what the next trait, agreeableness, is all about. Agreeableness is an individual's propensity towards social harmony. How willing a person is to forfeit or compromise their own benefits for the sake of a positive environment. Highly agreeable people are compassionate and trusting, whereas less agreeable people are unconcerned with other people's feelings and generally suspicious of people's motives. Wow, that second type of person sounds like a real hassle to be around. Yeah, I can only imagine what it must be like having to do with that type of person. Every week, for eternity, trapped in a studio listening to their banal banter. <sighs> Anyway, for all the disadvantages of being a disagreeable person, it's easy to imagine that in most circumstances, it's exactly these types of people who end up getting what they want. It could be that the less agreeable person is happy disrupting social order to bring about change that they usually get their way. Or it could be because the more agreeable person just wants them to shut up. Either way, you could consider this a type of dominance. Their disagreeability, which I just found out is actually a word, allows them to dominate more agreeable people. But at what cost, culture? Do people really respect whiners and complainers? The squeaky wheels of the world? Well, it's one thing to just moan and groan about your lot in life, but another entirely to actively affect change in a system that you find dissatisfactory. Revolutionaries, innovators, these are the types of people that we look back upon with respect. These are dominant people because they were leaders whose ideas inspired others to follow them. This type of leadership is called transformational leadership, in which the leader acts as a role model for the follower and attempts to tie the follower's identity to the project at hand. In the case of a revolutionary, they must get their followers to believe that the movement or cause will succeed by their own actions. But you don't have to be respected to be dominant. Take my boss, for example. He's fussy, obsessive, and lectures me all the time. I didn't know you had another job. I don't. Oh, very funny. Well, maybe I wouldn't have to constantly harangue you if you took a bit more pride in your work. Uh, why? Just why? Better out than in, I always- Shut up, please. But yeah, you do have a point. Not all people in positions of power control others through inspiration. Transactional leadership, for example, is a more detail-oriented approach in which the leader, let's say a supervisor, keeps his workers on track by constructing a plan and monitoring deviations from the expected path. That may sound kind of cold, but the transactional leadership strategy is still about rewarding people for achieving goals. In fact, this kind of leadership is best in emergency situations and military training, where discipline and consistency are essential for responding to life or death situations. Why even bother having a leader at all? Why does one person have to be dominant over the others? Can't we all just get along, culture? Because leaders give us visions, creating a focal point for the group's efforts. It's like on a movie set. If every cast and crew member had equal say in the final production of the movie, then work would either stall, or the final work would be such a compromise of ideas that it would lose the original message. As the saying goes, a camel is a horse designed by committee. The role of the director is to guide the other members in crafting his or her vision of the movie. In some people's minds, this creates a hierarchy, and they reject this notion because it means unequal distribution of power. But I prefer to think of it as a structure, a format in which we can more constructively and efficiently create. <gasps> it's just like Jordan Peterson says. Hierarchies are inevitable because we're just like lobsters. Well, I, I'm not sure I agree with that logic. Also, some men have one giant claw called a crusher claw that is highly attractive to girls. Okay, that part is just plain wrong. Yep. 
Just like lobsters. Also, something about serotonin. I forget that part. Are you done? I don't know. Are you done? I don't get what your point is with all this leadership stuff. My point is that it's not enough just to be assertive. It's how you go about being assertive that really matters. You should hold true to your convictions and lead by example rather than heavy-handedly forcing your worldview upon others. Most of the traits I personally think embody bad leaders are due to the third trait, neuroticism. Neuroticism is essentially emotional instability, one's proclivity for negative emotions. This could be anger, depression, or uncertainty. Anxiety can make a leader weak, as followers lose faith that their leader knows what they're doing. Anger similarly is the hallmark of a bad leader, as it generally indicates a loss of control over the situation. So when I spilled Code Red Mountain Dew all over the couch last week and you flew off the handle at me, it was because you'd lost control of the situation? Crash, since the day I met you, I've lost control of the situation. Is it just me or did that sound weirdly romantic? It's just you, Crash. It's always just you. When people react adversely to stress, they stop thinking clearly and act irrationally. For me, that's a huge issue. But there's still a huge contingent of people out there who see people acting out of this insecurity and interpret this anger as passion or anxiety as self-awareness. But personally, I don't think we should be admiring these qualities. What we should admire is how people pull themselves out of these situations, how they regain their composure and press on. So when you say stuff like how a gorilla beating their chest is asserting their dominance, it worries me. If we have to have a hierarchy, if we have to follow someone, I'd rather follow someone with a cool head, a vision, and a passion, rather than an angry toddler throwing his toys around. I think I get what you're saying, Culture. You think a dominant person should be someone who's bold rather than brash. Exactly. Perfectly put. When we look at it that way, it's not about the dominant person saying, I'm better than you, but rather, I want you to help me so we can both be better. And if we can make that the new definition of dominance, then, yeah, I think it's good to be dominant. What a beautiful final note to leave our audience with. And guess what? We got through a whole video about domination without once mentioning BDSM! See you all next week! If you enjoy what we do here at Culture Crash, please consider supporting the show via our Patreon, where we have a bunch of awesome rewards, or by checking out our online store. All links are in the description below.